not going to go in details in region and what, what's affecting each region, but we will talk about the differential diagnosis in general uh, and the clinical decision-making process. So, and we will look at the key factors in the history when we uh, examine the patient and we take the history. Uh, we will uh, make sure that there are some key factors to uh, distract, to tell us uh, where are the uh, red flags, yellow flags, or uh, any risk factors. And we will uh, look at signs and symptoms associated with that, uh, whether that uh, be a musculoskeletal or non-musculoskeletal origin uh, of the disease itself. And then uh, putting that together and uh, looking at where is this pain coming from and why is this pain mm -hmm. happening in, in general. Of course, the time limit will, uh, will not allow us to do a lot of things that we like to do. Uh, however, you get the sense of it when you see the patient for the time and uh, how you like to proceed uh, and, and to take in uh, uh, clinical reasoning and, and apply it in your practice. Like the message, practice with evidence. Practice with evidence and treat with hypothesis. You, know, you treat the patients while you have something in mind that uh, what am I treating in this patient? So, uh, before we start there, uh, uh, I hope that everybody is staying a lot uh, and uh, taking all the necessary precautions. Uh, I uh, recorded this uh, uh, numbers at 3.30 and the numbers are increasing by uh, by the minute, so that uh, currently we have more than 2 million people across the world infected by the COVID-19, and that's uh, about 133,000 uh, died from this disease. Uh, the United States taking the lead of the number, so we have uh, here more than 600 uh, thousand people infected. Uh, I, I, I think that because of the uh, numerous testing that we apply here, a lot of people that uh, they, they've been tested uh, for that and the recording also is, uh, uh, is very uh, uh, transparent and we record every patient uh, that we see numbers, you will see that numbers are very clear. Uh, and uh, uh, still the number of uh, uh, new death uh, every day is, uh, is very high, still uh, it might be reported last 24 hours, uh, more than 1,500 deaths. Uh, and, uh, in Saudi Arabia, the numbers also is increasing. It's uh, like almost 6,000. 6, and the first time to see in Egypt, the numbers are jumping. Like yesterday was uh, 2,000, today is 2,500. So it is, it is a serious issue and it is going, uh, it's growing. And I hope everyone uh, will take the necessary precautions that you hear in the news uh, and take all the necessary precautions. But because we are talking about differential diagnosis, uh, I'd like to, you to pay attention to uh, the common signs and symptoms of that COVID-19. Uh, so the, you have like three groups here of, uh, of signs and symptoms. There are some people who comes with only uh, fever and uh, shortness of breath. Uh, and this is, we call that mild symptoms. It's not really necessary to go to the hospital. Uh, there is no need uh, to uh, any medical intervention, uh, except that you take some maybe uh, anti-fever uh, medications uh, to uh, control your fever. That's what uh, you need to take. Uh, and I would recommend not to go to the hospital if that happened. But if that comes to breathing difficulties, that's, the, that's an immediate danger that, the patient, that you have to seek medical attention. So that's from shortness of breath, you know, I feel like a like little bit winded. A little, little bit, you can control that, staying at home, uh, stay in isolation. Uh, but if it is that you are not able to breathe, breathing difficulties, that when you need to uh, seek medical attention uh, immediately because the, uh, the, the curve is, is so fast that once they have that breathing difficulties, uh, most of these patients that they will need the 
uh, respirators. So they, they need to be on uh, uh, in the machines immediately so to help them. And these are the common signs and symptoms. There are some reported diarrhea and uh, GI symptoms, uh, but this is with severe cases. So severe cases that we see, we see here, and that's like the pneumonia, uh, acute respiratory uh, stress uh, uh, syndrome on the, uh, on the system. Uh, usually those who get this uh, uh, severe symptoms, they, uh, they die and the number of deaths is, is increasing. And again, uh, I uh, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to save uh, all of you and save your families and stay uh, inshallah and safe and practice all the precautions that you need to practice. So uh, what is differential diagnosis and what is the screening? And, uh, we, we will uh, talk about the red flag, yellow flag risk factors. We try to differentiate between them, how that will help you in your diagnosis. Uh, the, uh, most of the Western societies, Western countries and uh, and even the east side of the of the world uh, are aging population aging and it's getting older and uh, the people have multiple uh, comorbidities uh, so you you will you will not see the patients like we uh, teach the students like uh, arthritis of the knee joint for example uh, and uh, uh, so you you are concentrating on the knee uh, no, now the patients are coming with diabetes, coming with hypertension, uh, coming with the uh, cardiac diseases. So you, you have multiple signs and symptoms in one patient and uh, it will figure it out. You have as, as a, a physical therapist now, you have to figure it out what, what's going on with this patient. Uh, not only that's multiple comorbidities, but also the disease progression. So the, uh, you may uh, check patients, for example, with, the, with diabetes at early stage, with the, uh, they are controlled, with the uh, blood sugar level is controlled, and you treat them for a month or two, and then uh, you'll find that things are not improving, and that might be because of the disease or, uh, is going on and affecting the patients more and more, uh, even while you're treating them, while you're seeing them. And do, why do we need all of that as physical therapists? And uh, we are not really uh, like to be a medical doctor. Uh, that, uh, so don't take me wrong that I am propagating that physical therapist to be a physician. I am proud to be a physical therapist. But now the physical therapy profession uh, is changing. That's uh, the, the direct access that we see the patient for the first time, uh, we evaluate the patients. We have now physical therapists are in the emergency room seeing the patient for the first time uh, and uh, diagnosing the patients with physical therapy diagnosis. Uh, so that, uh, and, and most of the physical therapy in the Western society, in the United States specifically, are a doctor of physical therapy. So graduating with doctoral degree, uh, so the, 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 the playing field, the environment now is changing to allow you as a therapist to come in and practice uh, your knowledge, practice your experience, and show that to your, uh, to your patients uh, with uh, good skills and good uh, critical uh, thinking. All right. So uh, if I uh, uh, look at the red flags, we will look at it from a different perspective. Uh, so when you take the past medical history from your patient, don't, don't get uh, that jump on the, uh, on the uh, existing condition immediately. Uh, take your time, uh, ask the questions that need to be asked and uh, make sure that you ask the questions in the medical history, in the past medical history that you need to know if this patient has cancer before, history of cancer. And that's a red flag. So if, if the patient, for example, you're treating patients with low back pain uh, and the uh, patient is not improving, uh, taking too much time, uh, and you did all what uh, uh, you learned to do uh, and you practice to do, and it should work and it's not working, uh, you need to consider what's going on in the past. Uh, the, the recent infection could be also a problematic in the uh, history of trauma 
or use of drugs or medications. Like for example, you're treating patients with the uh, 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 cortisone injection that, that they're, they're getting so many uh, or, or on their corticoids for a long period of time. Uh, and this patient coming with the mid thoracic pain, for example, and uh, this patient may have compression fracture and uh, you don't know it because of osteoporosis, uh, long use of uh, cortisone. Uh, that may lead to, to that kind of, uh, of problem. Also need to identify the red flag from the clinical uh, presentation of the patients. Uh, like you ask the patients, is that the, uh, how does that happen? Uh, and, uh, most of the time the patients say, I don't know, the insidious of the symptoms uh, without reason, that may be cons may, may consider as a, a red flag, uh, no composition, uh, no position of comfort. So the patients will tell you that I am not feeling comfort any in any of the positions. Uh, unexplained weight loss or weight gain, uh, that's also a, a red flag. Uh, symptoms of uh, out of proportion, and the patients will. Uh, uh, maybe have some, uh, very, you think it is very few uh, or very minor strain of the muscles, but the patient presenting with so much pain uh, or lack of motion, uh, and that's maybe also a red, a red flag. Am I talking too fast? Anybody can, uh, are you still there? So we have, all, all right, good. Fine. Uh, there are some examples of that can be mixed between risk factors. You can consider as a risk factor or you may consider as a red flag. For example, if, if we take the age, age that may be a risk factor in some diseases and may be a red flag in others. And uh, we'll, we'll give example while we presenting a patient case uh, in, uh, toward the end of the lecture. Uh, also gender. There are some gender specific diseases that may be considered as red flag uh, and uh, uh, smoking is a red flag or risk factors, especially with this uh, COVID-19. Uh, those who are smokers, they are more vulnerable uh, to be attacked by this, uh, by this virus. So if, you, if, if any of you, I, uh, I hope that none of you smoking. So if any of you smoking should stop it immediately because if, if you don't do it right now, it will be, your life is in danger. It's not a joke anymore, all right? The weight loss or weight gain, again, is uh, also a risk factors. Uh, race and ethnicity, I don't know if it's there in, in, in Egypt, maybe, uh, uh, you can say Saida يختلفوا عن اللي في اللي في البحيرة في in their environment and their way of uh, dealing that can can have a specific diseases different and also the occupation uh, can be a risk a risk factor or a red flag. These are the mix it together and sometimes we need to untangle that and see which one is risk factor, which one is red red flag. And before I jump in into uh, examples, a specific example for the lower quadrant, uh, I, I need to present to you the uh, why do we need uh, to do that screening. Uh, for example, in, in the United States in 2019, uh, the cancers uh, in, in males and females, uh, it's the, these are the estimated new cases of cancer. It's, the numbers are scary. It's getting a lot of people getting are now treated from, but there are reported cases, especially in me. Uh, the prostate cancer came on top now, uh, and the lung cancer came down. Uh, it used to be the cancers on the top uh, because of the smoking. Now the smoking is, is reduced tremendously in the United States, and the prostate cancer is coming on the top. Uh, females still the breast cancer on the top, and followed by the uh, uh, cancer. If you look at that, who died from that, that you find the, the, the opposite, so that you find the more people dying from lung, can lung uh, cancer in males and females, followed by the second one, it's the prostate cancer and breast cancer. Uh, so the, the, uh, you may be treating patients with cancer and you don't know, 
Uh, and it may be the life of this patient depending on you, uh, how to detect and how to evaluate that uh, when you do your uh, diagnosis. Keep that in mind while we're screening for the lower quadrant so we can uh, look at uh, specific uh, problems from, uh, from now. Now, if we uh, uh, start at the lower quadrant of the lumbar spine going down to the pelvis, going down to the lower extremity, uh, in the lumbar pain, lumbar, any pain in the lumbar spine can be under uh, one of these specific uh, reasons. Maybe uh, spondylogenic, maybe neurogenic, vasculogenic or viscerogenic or psychogenic. What, what are these terms? So a spondylogenic is coming from the structure of the spine itself. So it might be coming from vertebral bodies, from ligaments, from muscles, and, and this has a specific characteristics. Like for example, uh, this pain, this type of pain, it's spondylogenic pain, usually aggravated by activities and relieved by uh, rest. So if the patient is telling you that when I walk, uh, move, when I work, uh, it gets worse, and when I sleep at the night time, uh, it's getting better, uh, that is the, uh, may lead me to spondylogenic reasons, causes, right? So the first question that you ask your patient, uh, uh, how is this patient? What aggravated and what's decreased the patient? What increased it and what's uh, decreasing this, this pain. The second uh, type of pain is neurogenic. It's coming from nerves. Coming, maybe compression on the nerve roots, compression of the, uh, on the spinal cord maybe, uh, and irritation of the nerve roots. And that usually have referred pain. So if it is any, any uh, pressure on the cord. So if the patient's uh, telling me numbness and tingling in the leg, so I will look at the neurogenic reasons uh, whether that to be at the nerve root level or at the, or the nerve itself, nerve cord itself. So that, that's a neurogenic uh, pain. Vascular pain is very important that we will spend some time for that uh, in, in this lecture as well. So the, you, you have several reasons for uh, vascular pain. So if you look, for example, the, uh, 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 the TOS or the thoracic outlet syndrome, the triple A, uh, abdominal aortic uh, syndrome is causing back pain, back ache, or peripheral uh, vascular diseases like sciatic pain. So these are the types of, uh, of pain that comes from vascular region uh, reasons. And I want you to be able to differentiate, is it coming from spinal issues or coming from vascular issues? And that's what the, the, your, your clinical uh, judgment and your clinical reasoning uh, should be uh, that's elevated to that level that you are able to differentiate uh, what are the origin of this pain, where it's, com mm -hmm. uh, where it's coming from. Viscerogenic, however, uh, that is uh, sometimes very confusing. The pain uh, may be uh, coming from a, an organ and presenting itself in, in, in other areas. For example, uh, pain in between the scapular region uh, that can have several, uh, can, can may, may be coming from the kidney, may be coming from the liver, may be coming from the uh, gallbladder. Uh, so the, the, these are viscerogenic or referred uh, pain. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there are some back pain is not aggravated by the activity. So if you, uh, ask your patients what aggravates the pain. They said the pain is still the same all the, all the time. When I sit, when I stand, when I walk, and, and the pain is not different. So it's not responding to the position or to the posture. And that you may think about viscerogenic pain at that, at that time. I hope that's clear for, uh, for you, inshallah. So uh, the uh, psychogenic pain, however, uh, the psychogenic pain uh, is non-organic uh, origin sometimes, or psychosomatic, or uh, come from anxiety. So you, you need to determine if this patient, uh, if this pain is coming from a, uh, somatic reasons or coming from psychogenic reasons, so you'll be able to help 
patient correctly that does not mean that you tell the patient the pain is not there that's not the case but the case is too different if the patient tell you that i have pain you should believe that because that uh, pain is there uh, but you need to also to use your clinical skill to differentiate how uh, how that will uh, will be different uh, different from one uh, one symptoms to the to the other having said that how how do we start so you uh, you start general outlines of the history first uh, uh, you uh, uh, look at the past medical history as we mentioned at the beginning that's very crucial and from that you identify red flag uh, yellow flags you look at the risk factor assessment so you need to have a tool uh, to collect that for example uh, if you have re an entry uh, sheet with you the patients will tell you is smoking not smoking if they are smoking how many cigarettes per day uh, so you can describe them if they, if they are heavy smokers or light smokers and how much risk that they have according to the to the disease also you need to look at the existing uh, signs and symptoms which will be the uh, uh, the clinical presentation for for this patient put that together and let us go and review uh, the systems when we say review systems that mean you look at the pain and see is that coming from uh, the musculoskeletal region reason or coming from uh, cardiovascular or coming from uh, GI symptoms and so that that's what you review the, your sem systems that's the review of the system differential diagnosis and and screening now are you ready so uh, we, we talked about the lumbar spine we're going to differentiate between uh, the five types of uh, lumbar pain if you go to the sacroiliac or the good that this is very next to the to the lumbar spine so we're going to look at the uh, where did this pain at if it is unilateral for example that will be more uh, toward the si joint uh, if this pain so the patients with the si joint specifically complaining with si joint pain uh, they will be one side more than the other uh, unilateral uh, they will the pain is increased when i get up from the chair so these are the key factors, key words that highlight in your interview. Uh, patient will tell you when I bend forward all the way, I give hagam al art. When I talia, that's when I rise from bending, that's where the pain with pain acts. They usually may be SI uh, joint. And the pain in the uh, in the SI joint, yeah, taht ruba. I mean, it's right at the knee level. Uh, very rare to go down uh, under the uh, below the knee level. Usually, stop at the at the knee level. But the most characteristics of that sacroiliac joint of the groin, the the pain in the groin, is very uh, crucial to know that this might be coming from uh, sacroiliac uh, sacroiliac joint. Sorry. Uh, uh, I want you to remember that uh, sometimes in the, in the past we we uh, we uh, thought that the primary cause of low back pain is coming from the SI joint. Uh, uh, McKinsey, for example, said you making fool uh, fool of yourself. If you evaluate low back pain without evaluating the SI uh, joint. Uh, the SI joint is sometimes confusing. I have lots of terminology in there, but you need to be able to uh, differentiate where is this pain coming from, from the lumbar spine on from the SI uh, joint. Uh, to help you to, uh, to do that, you need to do good examination. Uh, so uh, the, when you examine the lumbar spine or SI joint, uh, you should have uh, tools first, it's called functional outcome tools. The functional outcomes like uh, uh, a Swiss tree, like the uh, fear avoidance questionnaire, and uh, Ronald Morris that for uh, pain behavior, it's very important tools uh, to first to start at the evaluation and then you follow up 
patients. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, those who are uh, educated in Egypt like me, and I'm proud to, uh, to say that, uh, currently the educational program are missing that functional outcomes. Put that under your, uh, uh, you know, underline that. So the, 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 we are not really good in using and utilizing the functional outcome measures. Uh, and that's very big uh, defect for most of the uh, uh, physical therapy curriculum uh, in our area. So uh, the fear avoidance questionnaire, because that uh, will determine the clinical prediction rules that we, will, we might be, uh, uh, will ask the Dr. Rafi and Dr. Salah, we may come back and talk about what are the clinical prediction rules, how to utilize it, and how to use it in our clinical practice. So the, the, these are the functional, the, these are the names, Oswestry, Ronald Morris, fear avoidance, and these are, uh, we call that outcome measures that we need to utilize to examine. So to start with that, uh, you need also to uh, evaluate the gait the, and the balance uh, with patients with the uh, lumbar spine, with patients with SI joint. Include the range of motion, of course, to the, and the hip joint, flexibility testing. So you need to look at the flexibility of the hip flexors, hamstring, uh, don't forget the lumbosacral fascia is very important to, uh, to look at the flexibility of that so you can differentiate between where is this pain coming, coming from. There are, uh, in, in this slide, uh, let me take that area right here, which is the, uh, we call that provocative testing. And the provocative testing, so that, that area right here, provocative testing are the uh, pain producing, so you uh, you produce the pain uh, to make sure to uh, to rule in or rule out its symptoms. Again, let me say that. So the, there are some testing. We call this the, the provocative testing, and the provocative testing is to rule in or rule out a uh, a disease or a diagnosis. Of course, you need that test to be. Uh, sensitive and test to be specific. So the good test is to have high sensitivity and the high specificity of the test, right? And, and, and that will, will help you to determine the uh, diagnosis or the, uh, the differential diagnosis for this case. All right, so uh, going forward, let me see, where is my mouse? For the SI joint, yeah, baby, uh, you need, how I can uh, remove that uh, annotation, yeah, Habibi, all right. Uh, so the, uh, when you look at the SI joint, uh, the SI joint pattern of pain is uh, localized at uh, around the SI joint in this area in the buttocks area and going in the back of the thigh and very rare to go down to the uh, under the uh, below the knee level but also the groin uh, area here is very crucial as well so this area here and here a uh, little bit the, the referred pain down may lead you to uh, test for the SI joint how we test for that there are some uh, good uh, uh, testing uh, that uh, the patients need to uh, be tested for. Uh, and the, we call that clinical battery of testing, clinical battery of testing. And uh, you, uh, there are some sensitivity specificity number for each one of these ones. Uh, if you are interested, I can send the uh, the article for that to Dr. Rafi, and he will make it available to you. Uh, so the uh, whether that gabbing test to open the pelvis, Faber test, the compression test, sacral thrust, that's where you concentrate on the sacrum and you thrust that, posterior th thigh thrust technique, and Genslin's. Genslin is very similar to Thomas test, but it's Genslin's test. These are six tests. If you get three out of five, so choose any of these five 
uh, and if you get three positive, that will lead you that this is an SI uh, joint issue that we, that we are dealing, dealing with. If I stop here for a second and uh, highlight, uh, you may highlight that yourself, uh, but you highlight two main tests that very specific to SI joint that will be the sacral thrust and the posterior thigh thrust. <coughs> Excuse me. These are the highly sensitive, highly specific tests for the SI joint. Uh, Chad Cook uh, from Duke University said if you uh, get these two first uh, positive, uh, that will confirm that you are dealing with SI joint uh, issues. So th sacral thrust, posterior thigh thrust. Uh, that provided that you do it uh, uh, in the correct uh, in the correct way, in the, the way that needs to be uh, to be done. Right, so uh, if I go down to the pelvis, uh, so we, we have the SI joint, we, we talked about the lumbar spine briefly, we talked about the SI joint. If for the pelvis itself, you may, you may differentiate that is, this is anterior pelvic pain or posterior pelvic pain in general. So anterior pelvic pain, you're gonna look at the uh, symphysis pupus, you're gonna look at the muscle attachment at the ASIS, the PSIR, the, the uh, anterior, superior, anterior, inferior iliac spine, uh, whether that's happening in the muscles, in the ligaments, that would be anterior pelvic pain. Posterior pelvic pain may, may, uh, you may confuse you with the SI joint and the sacrum. So you get to, to, to do that as well. Again, I'm, I'm not teaching a specific disease or a specific treatment. I am identifying the differential diagnosis that needs uh, to identify red flag and yellow flags that you need to deal with. So if I am treating a patient with the lumbar spine pain, with uh, posterior pelvic pain, and she is a female, for example, right? And while you're taking the history, uh, she is like 45, 50 years of age, and you ask about the menstrual cycle, and uh, will tell you, a doctor, I am out of it uh, about three years now. Uh, three years, uh, uh, don't have the period, don't have the menstrual cycle. Uh, and uh, you're treating this patient and is not responding to you, and then in, in one day, it's, uh, she said that I do have some bleeding, uh, post-menopausal bleeding. It is a very, uh, indicator, very good indicator that you need to transfer this patient immediately because this might be a cancer, endometrial cancer. So the gynecological reasons in the low back pelvic area are very crucial, very important. Uh, you're taking uh, history from the patient, for example, uh, and, uh, and she said that, that uh, the menstrual period is, uh, uh, menstrual cycle is, is uh, regular, However, I get some bleeding in between, uh, in between the time. So intermenstrual or postcoital bleeding. Postcoital, they mean after the, uh, the, the sexual uh, interaction, and that's the bleeding after that. These are, uh, again, an indicator of cervical cancer. Cervical cancer may present itself by uh, that bleeding in between the menstrual cycle or between uh, in or after uh, after uh, uh, sexual interaction. So if you take a good history of your patient, you will be able to identify your red flags and you can uh, save the patient's life. Of course, you uh, if you're treating patients from pelvic pain or uh, the uh, back pain, back issues, uh, and she is, so you're gonna look at the history of pregnancy, how many uh, were normal uh, delivery or uh, C-sections, uh, and the, in the, if there are any uh, pro prolapsed uh, uterus, uh, if any history of fibroids or adhesions, uh, that's, you, you need to be able to differentiate between a spondylogenic pain that in the lumbar spine or the, on the pelvis, and the gynecological pain are coming from the uh, different uh, areas of the, of the pelvis. 
There are some uh, uh, common conditions that we will uh, speak about very fast. Uh, of the time, uh, the timing is, is going very fast now. Uh, three conditions that I, I will address first, and then we'll see if the time will allow. Uh, the abdominal aortic aneurysm, the DVT and the new plasmas or the cancer in the lower extremity. So I'm talking about the uh, all from the lumbar spine all the way down to the foot. Uh, the abdominal uh, aortic aneurysm or the triple A, we call that triple A. The aorta, of course, is the main uh, uh, artery of, the, of your body and it's uh, and, and sometimes the dilation of this part of the uh, uh, of the uh, aorta uh, can cause a lot of problems. So the, this can be right above the umbilicus. So the umbilicus is right there. You palpate. You put your hand, and uh, uh, let me uh, advise myself first and you when you treat patients. 50 to 60 years of age or older, mainly males, but females also get it. Uh, so you, uh, and uh, uh, you see that pulsating abdomen, the abdomen has a lot of uh, uh, pulsations and the patient has back pain. You got to measure the aorta, how much is it? How much the distance between uh, the midline between the linea alba, that's the midline, and where you feel the pulse on the sides. If it's that more than uh, uh, three to four centimeters, uh, you should raise the alarm and take, again, go back in history, talk to the patient, see what is the problem, and you may need a, a, a vascular uh, specialty. Uh, uh, the, the, to, to refer this patient for. Why is that? Uh, again, the, uh, because men is more than women, affected more than women, at the age of that uh, triple A, that I know our uh, aortic aneurysm, uh, it's between the uh, fifth and sixth decades of life. Uh, the, uh, you have, uh, the, again, the risk factors of obesity, so the obese people, and when you palpate, you get to dig deep so you can palpate, you can measure it. And again, smoking coming with us in most of the risk factors. I hope that uh, we uh, are able to teach our community to stop smoking. Uh, high blood pressure also is, is a risk factor for the aorta, uh, aortic aneurysm. Strenuous exercises. Let me stop here for a second. Yeah, like uh, the people comes to a later time of age, for, for, like for example, at 40, 50, uh, and they start to uh, have their metabolism lowered, they gain more weight, and they said it's time to do the exercise. And they go do uh, strenuous exercises, weightlifting, and that is a risk factor for the, I'm not saying not to do it, but you need also to be checked uh, for your uh, health before you do strenuous exercise programs, right? Uh, patients also with, the, uh, with high cholesterols, with the emphysema, uh, if they have any uh, family history of aneurysm, uh, all these pe people need to be checked very, very carefully. So I hope from now uh, and that come uh, to you as, as a physical therapist, that you palpate the aorta Get used to that. It will take time that uh, till you till you get to, to that. It just takes time to do it, and you need to uh, uh, start uh, to uh, get used to that. So you make sure that you save your patient's life uh, if the patient has any problem with that. Uh, there are some uh, signs and symptoms that you may detect. Uh, to tell you that this patient have uh, uh, aortic aneurysm, uh, the, uh, again, the abdominal pain and back pain. So back pain will have an abdominal pain with it, may go down to the groin and the flank. Flank is the, the side, uh, side posteriorly, that is the flank, your side. Uh, and and the, the pain will, uh, will be described as throbbing, pulsating pain, uh, beyond booked. 
uh, how uh, the patients may tell you that tearing or ripping, ripping, ripping can be atafi. That's what is the, uh, the the description of the pain coming, maybe in the back, maybe in the in the abdomen as well. Uh, a rapid, severe, impending pain in the groin uh, and in the low back pain. So it will be, and uh, the pain is uh, it's getting worse uh, and it's getting worse fast, fast and fast. And that's in the, in the lower back and in the groin as, as well. Unable to find a position of comfort. Uh, and the uh, patients will tell you an hassan fee. Uh, that's the pulsating mass in the abdomen uh, that with or without pain. So the, uh, you need to be careful with that because there are high mortality rate. And yani patients may die uh, from, from these signs and symptoms uh, of, the, of, the triple, of the triple A. All right. Uh, patients may also have uh, uh, like the vomiting, uh, nauseated, uh, the, the pain may radiate to the posterior thigh as well. That's all coming from the aortic aneurysm. Uh, there are some uh, measurements if you'd like to see that. Uh, uh, if the, uh, if the, uh, the distance between the pulses, so you, pulse, you, you uh, uh, palpate in the aorta uh, right at the umbilicus or a uh, little higher than that and that's very minimal like like one centimeter higher than in the uh, between the sides if they are more than four centimeters uh, that's what the danger will will come and the danger will increase uh, in like if it is eight or greater so it will be 50 percent uh, the risk of rapture so that's if it is, this is the, the, the size and the risk of fracture. So if it is increased in size, there is potential that when you do the exercise program, that patient may rupture. And if the, uh, they said that uh, if, the, if the aorta is ruptured, the mortality rate is very high, like between 60 to 80%. If the patient is in the hospital and the rupture happened, this percent will, will decrease because they, they have the they already in the hospital decreased by to 30 to 40 percent. But there is high mortality rate with the rupture of the of the aorta. And so again, because you are a physical therapist, you have to examine that carefully and exam and you're doing exercises for your patient. Sometimes you push the patient yeah, beyond the limits. So you got to be careful and, uh, and save your patient's life by just palpating the, uh, the aorta and if the patient had these problems. Second issue that I, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to discuss also the deep vein uh, thrombosis, DVT, and uh, to, to uh, uh, look at the risk factors for that. Uh, again, if the patient has major surgery uh, or bedridden for a long time, mobilized, or after joint replacement, that's the big percentage of the people get that, like up to 24%, 25%. Uh, hip fractures specifically have high percentage of DVT. How we know? Uh, there are tables there that can help you. So the, if you use the WILLS criteria, uh, that can help you to uh, differentiate, to take in or out uh, the possibility of DVT. Uh, so for example, active cancers, you put one, if the patient bedridden for more than three days, you put one for that, uh, or uh, has major surgery, so you uh, one for that. If there is a calf swelling, calf muscle swelling more than three centimeters, so you you measure the girth, you measure the uh, the parameters the, the, of the uh, calf muscle and compare between one side and the other. Uh, so if it's that uh, more than uh, three centimeters, you put one for that. Uh, if there is entire leg swelling, you put one for that as well. Uh, if there are localized tenderness along the deep vein uh, system, deep venous system, so you, you palpate the venous system. If it is tender, you put one for that as well. Pitting edema, uh, one for that. Uh, and if the patient has alternative diagnosis, like that, signs and symptoms may be described by other diagnosis, 
you uh, take two out of the, of the score. So if the patient, for example, have one or two points, one to two points, that would be moderate probability of DVT. You know, DVT is very crucial that you have to determine that, how to do diagnose it. And then if the score, if the patient score between three and eight, which is the maximum, this is very high probability uh, of DVT. Uh, it, it is recommended if the patient has more than two points that to consider D dimmer, it's a blood test to do detect the proteins that helping the, uh, that, that to, to tell us that there is a clot in there. So that, that need to be done uh, or to do the ultra ultrasonography uh, the, the, so to differentiate. All right. And now moving on to the new plasma cancer, cancer risk factor. So if you think that uh, this patient has cancer uh, while you're treating uh, neck pain, uh, I mean back pain, pelvis, uh, hip, knee, uh, so you, uh, what, what should you go there? What are the questions that you need to ask? First, that you need to look at the previous history of cancer anywhere in the body, doesn't have to be the same area anywhere in the body. Uh, if the patient is over now here, the age is a risk factor. Age is a risk factor. 50 years of age and patients coming with groin pain, hip pain, you got to rule out any uh, possibility of cancer. If uh, male, uh, the highest possible cancer there is the prostate cancer, need to be uh, ruled in or out. And for females, you look at other, uh, the, the ovarian cancer, the uterine cancers, or any endometriosis, that's all the gynecological problems. So you, they, you get to look at that as well, as well. There are some other factors that are risk factors, like if you're treating the patients forever and the patient is not improving, you get to consider what, where is this coming from. The recommended period is a month or more. Like if you treat patients for, uh, like say you're seeing the patient two, three times a week uh, for four weeks and patients is not improving at all. That may be a risk factor. Uh, the patients is uh, losing weight, but not planned and uh, unremitting on uh, un unrelenting night, night pain. So the pain is in the night time was pain and sweating that might be uh, problematic as, as well. All right, I will skip that. I think I'm coming closer to the end of the time. I need to present one case study uh, and then we'll give you the presentation for that. These are other common uh, conditions of the lower quadrant that you need to check for. Uh, I will go over it very fast here. Uh, the Cauda equina syndrome, infection and closing spondylitis, uh, so you, uh, for the coda equina, for example, it might be an, an immediate referral. You don't try, if, if the patient has the uh, back pain, don't continue with that. And the first signs and symptoms that you lead you to send the patient to the doctor immediately is the urine retention. So if, the, if you think that this patient is getting urine retention because of the cauda equina that need to be uh, surgically treated within 48 hours. That will get better results, right? So cauda equina, uh, problems, infections, if there's an infection, uh, ask the patient if, uh, if she is. So UTI, uh, urinary uh, tract infections is very uh, famous in that area. Uh, may cause the uh, back pain, pelvic pain as well, ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, you're treating patients, mostly male, 15 to 25 years of age, and is telling you that I'm taking too much time to prepare myself to go to work in the morning, right? So the morning delay in activity, uh, that may be a sign of ankylosing spondylitis. So you look at that and you evaluate that carefully or refer the patient to a rheumatologist as soon as you can. Or this pain coming referred from the abdomen and we talked about the, the aortic aneurysm as an, an example. There are some other conditions that they may confuse you while you're treating the 
extremity here, like uh, uh, referred pain, for example, or radiating pain. Uh, there are some area right there, uh, it's called the, the uh, um, myralgia parathetica that comes like, uh, if that, the inguinal ligament. Uh, so you will have the skin under this area right here on the lateral thigh. Uh, it may, the patients may present itself as if they have uh, the uh, bursa, trochanteric zitis, uh, and they actually have the lateral cutaneous nerve uh, uh, syndrome, which is um, myralgia parathetica. Uh, how you differentiate? So appendicitis is uh, one of the uh, uh, issues that you need to look at as well. Uh, uh, and that's, that comes at the right side of the uh, of the pa patients may present to you walking as if they have uh, sciatic pain or in the lower back, the groin, and that might have appendicitis. So when you uh, palpate, uh, you should palpate the whole abdominal cavity. And there are some, uh, like either you divide it into four sections or eight sections according to uh, whatever uh, a book that you're reading or practice. So if you divide the abdominal cavity into four, for example, you have the right and the right lower, the left upper and the left lower. Right, and the right lower here is very important. If the patient is male or female, they may have appendicitis or female may have uh, ovarian uh, cyst that causing the groin pain and maybe the back as, as well. So this is the, the, how to differentiate uh, between these patients. All right, see your interaction. See if you uh, uh, can to me when I ask the questions, uh, what should you do with this patient? Uh, this uh, case is uh, uh, of 20 years old, basketball player. Uh, he has history of repeated shoulder dislocation and decided to underwent uh, to do the surgery. So he did the surgery and they did uh, reconstruction of the joint, got the rehab three months and uh, is getting better on the shoulder. He is coming to you today uh, reporting uh, to look at to check his shoulder and he is telling you that his shoulder is okay, it's fine. But uh, while he was uh, getting back to the training and running, uh, he reported right calf muscle pain. So again, concentrate with me, right calf muscle and cramp during running. And uh, he described that pain as dull, aching in nature. And the pain started during reconditioning of the basketball training for two weeks ago. This pain started two weeks ago. And uh, he felt, while he's practicing, he felt a pull in his groin area and calf muscle while sprinting, while running. Uh, so we need to check the functional uh, uh, movement of the, of the body and see what is the manual muscle testing. Uh, what's going on there, you need to check the uh, uh, pain level and you need to palpate to see what are the uh, uh, condition of the muscles. Uh, you need to look at the passive and active motion. What's the difference between them? That's, that's all good answer, very good, very good answer. So let me give you some, what are the findings and tell me the diagnosis and what should we do next. All right, so findings, are you ready? You need to see the findings. Okay, so the findings here uh, in the left lower extremity, you know the pain was on the right side. The left lower extremity was fine as five over five, the uh, manual muscle testing, MMT manual muscle testing. And uh, the right lower extremity, the right lower extremity has different, uh, uh, different uh, practice here. So now uh, they have, how I uh, remove that? All right, let me see, participant, take attendee. Uh, all right. 
trying to remove that from my face. All right, so there are weakness. There is weakness in the, uh, good, uh, weakness of the, uh, of the right. You remember the pain was in the right calf muscle. So we have weakness and pain. And the weakness is at the three over five. It's really weak, kind of. Uh, of what muscles? Hip flexors, knee extensors, ankle dorsiflexors. So we have, again, a weakness of the right lower extremity, three over five uh, for hip, hip flexors, for uh, knee extensors and ankle dorsiflexors. The groin pain, are you with me? Groin pain was reproduced with right passive abduction. When you do passive abduction, a patient has pain in the groin. All right, are you ready? Now, when I did the uh, right passive ankle dorsiflexion and uh, blunt flexion, well, both were painful, limited, uh, limited by pain or by uh, stiffness. When I measure the girth of the calf muscle, the right side was 3.5 more than the left side. 3.5 more than the left side. When I touched the uh, calf muscle, especially at the venous system, was very tender. All right, so what do you think? What do we have? What do we have for this patient? How we assess the triple A. Again, patients has tenderness of the calf muscle. You have 3.5. And if I go, are you there? Uh, and it's, there are some exam lumbar spine. Provocative test. Again, it's the, uh, the, the one that we, Islam, uh, Islam Abu Mira, uh, that, that check the DVT. So how you check the DVT? And these are the, the findings that we found. That's the right, the, the passive ankle dorsiflexion, plantar flexion was both uh, painful and limited. And the girth uh, was 3.5 centimeters of the right more than the left. Now I'll take you to uh, the, uh, the table, if you will. Uh, where are the table? Let me take you, yeah, this table right here. So if you look at this table uh, and let's see how many points that this patient will get. Uh, patient has major surgery, right? Whether or not in the same side or in the same joint, on the same limb. So the patient has major surgery uh, right before that. Up to four months, four months can cause DVT. So that uh, just be careful that major surgery, patients coming to you outpatient clinic and you're treating them, you got to be very careful on evaluating that DVT. So that patient has like major surgery for the shoulder. That's so that can take one point for that. Uh, calf swelling more than three, he was 3.5 more on the one side. So that's another point, two points. What else? Localized tenderness along the deep venous thromboses. So the, the, if you have localized tenderness, that would be three uh, points on Will's DVT criteria. And this is how you use the criteria to determine if this patient has uh, probability of DVT or or not. So they are they have three and three to eight high probability. You need to order a D dimmer or to do ultra uh, son sonography. And this is an example of the DVT and how you detect it with patients even treated with the uh, with shoulder shoulder. Pain.